I mentioned before that Sheridan Christian Church kind of played a role in my life and in uh, growing up, but it wasn't really until I was in about junior high school uh, that that happened. I didn't go to church that much as a kid, and uh, that church, there, there was a couple of things that took place. Number one, there were, there were people who actually cared about me. Like, it th- didn't matter where I was from or what I was doing, and that meant a lot because, you know, as having a, a single mom and a lot of dads that were kind of in and out, they were never like really dad, but, you know, the guys were, were kind of in and out, and then when, when my stepdad came into the picture, he and I just never really saw eye to eye, more of a strict disciplinarian uh, kind of a guy. And so to be loved, to be cared for, that meant a lot. And, and that really kind of built a bridge. And they were able to, to take some time and, and minister to me, whether that be through like youth group type of activities. Eventually I gave in and went to the uh, morning church services and Sunday school. Or even just one of the guys saying, hey, what are you doing on whatever night? I don't even remember what night it was. And we got together and did kind of a personal study together. And he just wanted to build into me how to become a man of God. And that has really meant a lot. But I never intended on being a pastor. I, I, even when I went to Bible college, believe it or not, that wasn't my thought process. It was, it was like, well, Bible college is probably going to give me a good foundation. Maybe I'll do that and. And so I'll just go to a community college. And there happened to be one there. So maybe I'll just do that. And you know, in talking to uh, the, the admission director at Nebraska Christian College, it's like, well, maybe just the first semester, just focus on being here. And during that time frame, God got a hold of my life. And then I went off to ministry. Believe it or not, after my freshman year of college, some church was brave enough. Maybe brave isn't the right word. I don't know. Uh, dumb enough to hire me. I, I was not ready to be in any kind of leadership position. I mean, I was a baby Christian at best. Uh, matter of fact, and I've shared it before, but this is something I kind of cling to. Uh, and I know that whenever she said it, she meant it positively, and, and I take it positively. One of my youth leaders had said, out of all the kids that came through the youth ministry, I can't believe you're the one that's a pastor. And, and so for me, that was like, you know what? That speaks a lot to where God's grace reaches and how it touches lives. And we're going to be talking a lot about biblical eldership, leadership within the church. And we're, we're kind of leading up to that through the study of what's referred to as the pastoral epistles. Uh, specifically talking about Paul's letter. Paul was an apostle, uh, a missionary. He went around and started churches. And he wrote letters to Timothy who was in the community of Ephesus helping the church to kind of get organized and trying to oversee good teachings inside of the church. And so as, as Paul is doing this, we're talking about, as a baby church, how do we establish godly leaders? Where do we get this from? And I want you to know that as much as we desire for, for us to have godly leaders, godly elders is the biblical word for it, meaning overseers, they, they oversee the different functionalities and the teachings of the church, there is room for everybody to serve. And we want you to know that. And I want you to know that I'm going to side probably more often than not on the side of grace because I believe had that church not given me the opportunity to serve, even when I didn't deserve it and probably shouldn't have even had it, it had opened up a door and I was able to serve in different capacities and I was able to learn and God was able to speak through that church into my life through opportunities. And that went on to the next church. And guys, there are times, I'm just going to be honest with you, there is a fear of inadequacy that has probably always been in my life. And any time I stand up in front of a group of people, I always feel like, man, I still need to work on this stuff. I still struggle with these things. And sometimes when I think of myself as being kind of the chief elder, the, the one with the preaching and teaching abilities and, and, and the position, like sometimes I think I, I fail as certain areas. And I want you to know that, that if you struggle, and welcome to the group. Like, there is nobody here that's perfect. There's nobody here that's already attained all of these measures. When perfection comes, then that means Christ has already returned. And we're all home in glory. And that would be an amazing day. But that's not today. I say that because I know that I've, I've served in churches that, that can almost get in a mindset that says, you know, unless you're perfect, you can't serve in a leadership capacity. And that's a really hard measure to live up to. 
And, and the problem with that is that the guys inside the room who were looking for other leaders, other elders in the church, if they were to hang a mirror in front of their face, they wouldn't measure up to their own standards. But we all need to be growing and achieving and learning. But how do we take this passage from 1 Timothy chapter 3 and apply it to all of us? That, that's going to be kind of the trick for today. And I'm going to tell you that I think these traits that are listed here in the first part of Timothy are, are actually good quality traits for every godly man. And that's why the men on Thursday mornings are studying the measure of a man based upon this passage and also Titus chapter 1 as Titus was trying to establish godly leaders on the island of Crete. But it carries over not just from the men. I think it also is, is there for all Christians, men or women alike. Like These are things that we can strive to be a part of. Some of them you'll have to change the wording. Like where it says to be the husband of one wife. Well, that probably doesn't fit the ladies so much, but can you be the wife of one husband? I think you can. So it requires us to maybe look at the passage a little bit differently. And as I said before, 1 Timothy chapter 3, page 643, if you're following along in one of the Bibles we provide. Now Paul is writing to, to Timothy, and we know that from our studies of chapters 1 and 2 that there are some traits of good godly leaders that are in place. Number one is that they oversee the teaching of good doctrine. Because we know that there were leaders, there were people coming into the church that had some teachings that they were doing that were not consistent with God's Word and with what God desired for His church. Namely, that of being legalistic and according to the law. So they believed in Jesus, but they also believed that the only way you could get to heaven was by keeping all of the commands and laws that God had already provided in the Old Covenant. And so, so Paul was trying to tell Timothy, you need to make sure that sound doctrine is taught, that these people realize that there is nothing, absolutely nothing you can do to earn your way to heaven. It doesn't mean we shouldn't work, we shouldn't do these good things. Because God has prepared good things for us to do, but they're not to attain heaven. It's not going to get us there. And so make sure people are on the right page. But that wasn't it. I mean, there were other false doctrines, false teachings that were going on inside of the church. But to oversee that is a good trait of a godly leader. And that's what we want leaders here to do. Oversee good teaching to make sure that we're adhering to the Word of God and not just a popular opinion and what's, what the current culture is. But we also know from chapter 2 that good godly leaders, they spend time in prayer. And they don't just pray for the people that they like or their own family. They pray for everybody. And they pray for their leaders. And this is an important piece because not only do they realize that they are subject to the leadership of other people, but in prayer alone they realize they're subject to the authority of God. Now the last thing that we, we want is people who are in leadership that are so full of themselves they miss that. They miss the idea that there are other people appointed ahead of them and that God has supreme control. Now I realize that as humans oftentimes we get self-centered. And we begin to think that the world revolves around us. And, and hopefully for us, that's just a kind of a phase that kind of comes and goes. Because I know it is for me. There are times I rely so much on God. And there are times that, that I feel like God isn't even on the radar. I'm trying to fix everything in my own power, my own ability, with my own thought process. And I'm trying to, to manage His church by my abilities instead of by His. And that's a time to acknowledge that and to repent and to come back. And I'm guessing that probably for you in your life, that may be a, an ebb and a flow that comes for you. That it's, uh, there are times where God is really at the forefront and you're trying to, to please Him. And other times, you're just all about you. Now, we want godly leaders that realize that it's not about them, but it's really about God and what He wants. And we also need to realize that, that they were praying for their leaders. And this is a position that we don't oftentimes adapt to. Uh, we are we're a pretty critical generation. We criticize the way that our parents raise us, the way that our grandparents treat us, the way that our kids behave. We criticize the teachers in the school. We criticize the government that's placed above us. But the reality is we should be praying for those positions of leadership. And that's a stance we can all take. But we can also realize that as we study through uh, chapter 2, that these, these guys were able to teach and Paul says, it was for this reason that I was proclaiming the good news. That's an important piece. We want leaders, we want elders who are going to be able to teach and proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. We call that the gospel. Now, 
as a leader, as an elder, that doesn't necessarily mean their job is to stand up here and preach week in, week out. It doesn't necessarily mean it's their job to lead a Bible study. But they should obviously be able to express to somebody else what Jesus has done, what His life has meant. And to be able to hold other people to that truth in Scripture. How can you oversee the truth if you don't have an understanding of the truth and you're not able to articulate that to other people? So that's an important piece. But in chapter 3 of 1 Timothy, we focus specifically on these, qu- these qualities or character traits of that of elder. Now when we say elder, I understand that that's maybe a biblical term that you're not familiar with. The term really means to oversee. Now we know that today because we have managers. We have managers in the workplace and they oversee the production line or they oversee uh, workplace quality control. They oversee human resources. There's lots of things that people can oversee. And so an elder is an overseer of the church. Oversees the good doctrine, oversees quality teaching, oversees the different programs, oversees the big picture of what's going on. And this is what what Paul is talking about here with Timothy. So we'll read in chapter 3 verse 1. The saying is trustworthy. Timothy, you can believe me when I say this. If anyone aspires, they want to be in the office of an overseer, they desire a noble task. Like this is this is a big deal. Like this isn't just some nonchalant, yeah, yeah, I guess I'll do that, and then I'm never gonna focus on it. Like this is an important piece. And if you say you're gonna do it, there's a lot of weight that comes with this. And and he goes on to explain, therefore. An overseer must be above reproach. Now, we're going to camp on this one, but we're also going to allow the next few verses to kind of sit underneath this heading. Because I believe above reproach is kind of an all-encompassing piece of information. To be above reproach is to have a good reputation. It's all of these good moral quality traits that fall underneath that heading. Like we want guys who are going to be a good leader at home. We want guys that are going to be a good business person. We want guys that are going to be the same yesterday, today, and forever. Just like that was the model that God set out before us. We want guys that are they're not going to be up and down in their, their attitude. They're going to be more even keel. They're going to be uh, very moderate. Or, or uh, the word maybe would be monotone, but not like steady there. But, but we do want guys who are, are steady. You know, they're not going to blow this way with that teaching and blow that way with that teaching and they're going to get on this fad and that fad. We want guys that are going to anchor themselves to the truth of God's Word. So we want godly men who are going to be above reproach to be of good reputation. It goes on to say that that happens in the community too. We want them to be good there. But let's see how Paul unpacks that for Timothy. And we're going to focus in on a couple of these traits now, I would encourage you guys, if, if you want to study these deeper, we're hitting these on Thursday mornings. We're doing uh, two a week and just kind of hitting them as we go through the book, The Measure of a Man. And, uh, and even if you don't want to go through that with us or it doesn't fit your schedule, I can give you the information. You can get a book and you can at least kind of go through that. And I would encourage you to do so. It says, therefore, an overseer must be above reproach, the husband of one wife. The husband of one wife is, is a, a term that's in this passage Maybe at times a little bit difficult to understand for where we are because there are some churches that would say if a man has ever been divorced at any point in time, then he cannot serve in the capacity of an overseer, an elder in the church. And there are some that would say that this passage is really talking about moral purity and that if a man even looks looks at a woman lustfully, as Jesus says in the book of Matthew, that he's guilty of committing adultery, a sin in his heart. And, And while those points could be true in some capacity. I believe that really what this was talking about was the culture and the climate at that point in time. There were obviously some people who lived a life of polygamy. They married more than one woman. And so Paul is trying to tell Timothy, like, this, this isn't right. This doesn't measure up to God's standard. Now, I understand that it can be difficult in that, that climate, that culture for a man to you know, divorce his wife and put her out to public disgrace and try to figure out how to care for her kids and what is it exactly he's supposed to do in this particular culture. That's understanding something that maybe doesn't apply to us as much today. I'm not saying polygamy doesn't exist. We don't deal with it maybe in the same setting as they would have, have dealt with it. But where I think it branches out is that we could say, yeah, absolutely, a guy should be of good moral stature when it comes to his sexual morality. He should be 
the husband of one wife. That means that he only has one wife. That means that he only looks at one wife. He only invests in one wife. Because that's the standard. One man and one woman for life. That's, that's how God created things to be. And as we look at this passage, then we have to ask that question like, so if a man gets a divorce, does that mean he's automatically disqualified because he had this wife and then he's got that wife? Well, boy, we could camp on this one for a while, but there's lots of different measurements through that passage. Number one, like at what point did he get a divorce? Was that before he came to know Jesus Christ or was that after? Uh, is he a, really a repentant guy? Did his heart and his mind change from the way that he was? Has he had enough time to really prove that in his life? You know, is he a, a saved, forgiven man? We see men throughout Scripture who have, are fallen men who could only be in leadership because of God's grace. And so I don't think this is any particular way uh, other than that, just to say that this is a current state of being, just like all the other traits are. They're talking about the, the condition of the man right now and in recent history. Where does he sit? How is he going? And I believe it would be a well-rounded group of elders to be able to evaluate where is the man's heart really at? What is the condition of his life? But I don't think that that's necessarily a disqualifier or a disclaimer from leadership because a divorce has happened. But it could be depending on the situation, if that makes sense. So how does this apply for, for women or how does this apply for us in general? Well, obviously we want a, a man who's going to lead us, who's going to be you know, morally pure with his wife, but we want as individuals to be morally pure. We want to be invested in one person and we want to have that solid relationship, that commitment, that covenant that is just between the two people. That's not between the two of you and a, a friend with benefits, that's between the two of you and porn, that's between you and whomever you choose to invite into the relationship. It's, it's really between the man and the woman and, and, and with God's blessing and seal of approval on it because He's the one that really makes the two become one. Now, as a woman serving in any kind of leadership capacity, I would say we want the same thing for the woman. I mean, we don't want somebody who is, who's going to be running around and who's not faithful. We want her to be right there and solid with her spiritual maturity and her sexual maturity as well. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, be sober-minded. This is that, that moderate mindset. You know, you're anchored in the truth of God. You're anchored in knowing that God is in control of all things. And so these huge ebbs and flows aren't huge ebbs and flows because you know in the end Jesus wins. Because you know that regardless of, of what struggle you face right now, that God is in control of that struggle. You want men who are, who are going to be even keeled and moderate in that kind of mindset. And they're going to be self-controlled. Now, self-control is an important piece, but I think it's also a bit misleading because self-control, as we give our life to Christ, we realize that it's really God's Spirit within us that helps to get us self-controlled. Because according to our own ability, it's really hard to get, get a handle on life. We try. Many of us, we try. We have this this model for morality, and we want to live up to that, and we fail repeatedly. And it's God's power, the Holy Spirit in us, that helps us. But the reality is they're not controlled by an outset sort of, uh, outside source of, of situations, circumstances, or conditions. Like, I'll be a good man as long as somebody's watching me. I'll be good as long as I'm not away on vacation, as long as I'm not doing this or that, or I'll be okay as long as I'm with this group, but when I'm with that group, I'm a different guy. Now, we want a guy that's self-controlled, that's, uh, that's not tossing back and forth based upon the different cultures, the different groups, the different trends of society, or even within the church culture and what's hot and what's not. We want a guy that's just going to be right there and he's controlled because he knows that that's who God has called him to be in Scripture. And that's true not just of guys, that's true of, of girls, and that's true of all of us in our spiritual growth. And we want them to be respectable, worthy of respect. Their life is lived in such a way that other people can't help but admire them. You know, they're honest. They're trustworthy. They do what they say they're going to do. You can count on them. That's the kind of guys, you know, that you know, when they say, you know, hey, I got your back, you trust that they got your back and you don't have to look behind your shoulders. Most of us, you know, we don't want that person who says, I got your back when, when you can't count on them week in, week out. It's a really hard, hard way to go. It's a hard to fight that kind of fight, spiritual or not spiritual. I mean, if you just enter into a, into a fist brawl, you want to know that the guy didn't run out the back door 
You know, when he's supposed to have your back. You need guys who are going to stay there and stay strong. But I think that another side note here is, as much as they need to be worthy of respect, we as a body of believers need to respect those who are in authority. And that comes back to what I said before, to our parents, to our grandparents, to the faithful saints, the men and women in the church that have gone before us, to our government leaders locally or not locally, to our church leadership. We need to find a way that we can respect people and give them the honor that's due them based upon the position that they're in. You know, are, are they always right? Do they always make the right decisions? No. They're human, just like you. And they make mistakes just like you. And sometimes, you know, maybe they're in the wrong position and they shouldn't be there. But you still have a responsibility to give people respect. And that's a hard thing, I think, for us to learn today. That they're hospitable. I think that the hospitable part, hospitality, we think of opening up your home to somebody. We think maybe cooking a meal, maybe taking somebody out to eat. I think it's a much bigger deal than that. I think hospitality is, is a frame of mind. It's saying that what I have is yours. So if you need something, I'm going to help you with what you need because I'm more concerned about you than I am about accumulating stuff for me. And so when we're hospitable, it changes the way that we perceive and the way that we interact with other people. We want men who are going to care more about people than we do they do about their possessions. That's the kind of leaders I want to serve, the ones that actually care. Hospitable. Able to teach. We covered that last week. Not a drunkard. Not a drunkard. This one, uh, again, without going into great detail, is something that I struggled with early on. Now, I would say that I had family members, still have family members, that have abused alcohol, you know, taken it to uh, a greater degree. And for some reason, sitting on the outside of the church looking in, I always felt like, you know, church people, especially those in leadership, couldn't drink alcohol at all. That was my frame of mind, and I've shared that before. And, I, and I've also shared before that I don't, I don't drink. Does that mean I haven't had a drink? No. That, that, that doesn't mean that at all. Does that mean that, you know, if you invite me over and say, here's a beer, uh, you know, that I won't drink it? I don't, I don't know what I'll do, but I probably won't. Okay? And it has nothing to do with what Scripture is saying. It's all about me. Like, I just don't like it. I'd rather have a glass of lemonade. That's, that's just me. Okay? So... Whatever your situation is, you need to understand the biblical truth of things. And the truth is that you can have alcohol. You shouldn't get intoxicated by alcohol. It shouldn't have you, would be another way of saying it. Because once it's got you, you're not thinking with a sober mind. You're not clear in thought. You're not self-controlled. Something else is now controlling you. And it's reducing your ability to think and act straight. I know, when I was in high school, I acted that way. I've experienced it. But um, what, as far as it comes to leaders, we want leaders who are not going to be controlled by anything. Now, I'm going to stretch this. I'm going to say it's not just alcohol. I'm going to say drugs. I'm going to say food. I'm going to say money. I'm going to say possessions. I'm going to say entertainment. I'm going to say whatever it is that could possibly consume somebody, that that becomes your drive. And when that becomes your drive more than God does, you have just made a false god. You have made an idol and you've put it in the place of where God should be. And so it doesn't matter whether that's caffeine or that's nicotine or whatever that is. If you've made that a higher drive than God, you have placed something where God needs to be. And my guess is we probably all struggle with something, if not some things, that take God's place. But we need to be working on that. We need to be striving to be controlled by ourselves and by God and not by these other things that are driving our, our time, that are driving our financial decisions, that are driving our, our day-to-day in-and-out decisions of life. Where does that fit? Are they bad things? Not necessarily. But we shouldn't be controlled by them, rather by, by God. So not a drunkard. Not violent, but gentle. We talked about this last week at the end of uh, chapter 2. It says, I want men everywhere to lift up holy hands in prayer. You know, meaning that you're bringing a clean life, a clean heart before God. Because if you're dealing with, with friction between other people, then that's standing between you and God. He actually goes on to say, or Jesus says in Matthew, that if you have uh, something against someone else, you should go settle that. And then come back and lay your gift at the altar. Make sure your heart is right with God 
And you do that by forgiving other people and reconciling a situation. So here, same situation. We don't want guys who are going to like to argue and fight and deal with anger. We want them to be peaceable guys. We want them to be peace-loving guys. Do they fight for what's right? Do they sometimes get irate? Probably because they're passionate about what's right. But they desire peace, not hostility. They desire God's will, not their own. Those are, those are huge pieces. So we want them to manage that. They, they're not a lover of money, of stuff. And he must manage his own household well. So we've got the overseer. That's a pretty important piece that you know, they're above reproach. But now we're talking about another category here that I want to hit specifically. And that is they manage their own household well. A leader, whether that's in church, whether that's an elder or a Sunday school teacher or somebody who's driving some sort of ministry team or whether that's just an average church goer, we're looking for people in Christian maturity who are able to manage their home well. Are they, are they investing the kind of time and energy they need to be at home? Are they providing and protecting and loving and serving at home the way that they should be? Because chances are, the way that they manage their home is going to be how they manage a business, is going to be how they manage a church. And that's what this passage is saying. We want men who are, who are going to manage their home well, that they're going to share the love of Christ at home in the way that they act, the way that they talk, the way that they communicate. And, and this isn't necessarily an easy thing. This is one that I struggle with. Um, struggling with it right now. Like, what does it mean to be the kind of, of husband, the kind of dad that I need to be according to the Gospel? Because it's so easy to be like the carpenter who's working on houses all day and goes home and says, you know what? The last thing I want to do is pick up a hammer. Like, I've been studying and I've been helping and I've been overextending and now I'm home. I just want to kick my feet up. Leave me alone. That, that is an, an honest you know, frustration. That's an honest dilemma. And I think that, that it's something that I have to work on and I think it's something that we want godly leaders to be aware of and to continue to work on. That they're dealing with things at home well. Because church, another word for church is family. As in, in my family, we have jobs to do. We have bills to pay. We have things that need to be accomplished whether we want to accomplish them or not. We have to figure out how to get along because we live in the same house. You know, there's a, a great deal of diversity. Every one of my kids is different and, and I can't even figure out, and you probably are in the same boat if you're married, how my wife and I got together because we're nothing alike. Like, how did that happen back in the day? Like, we, we used to have so much in common. I think it was a myth. I think love just put blinders over our eyes. And then one day we woke up and went, you know, I don't really like to do that. And so we have to figure out how do we, how do we coexist? We, we have different ideas of what it means to manage money or to discipline children or you know, to, to take time away. You know, I take a time away and I want to do stuff. She wants to read a book. I find that boring. Like, if I'm going to read a book, I might as well go back to work. Like, this is not my idea of fun. That's, that's you know, tension that you deal with. Well, how does that carry over to the church? Guys, there is so much diversity here, so many different personalities, so many different likes and dislikes, and, and your baggage is different than somebody else's baggage, and your day was different than somebody else's day. And so when you come in, you've got to figure out, okay, we got bills to pay, we got jobs to do, we got personalities to manage, how's all this going to work? And if you can't do that in your home with a few people, you can bet it's going to be hard on a larger scale with a larger group of people. And so we need guys that are going to be able to do that, but we need people. We need church, uh, we need church people, Christian people, who are going to be able to figure that out. Who, care, who will care for God's church. He must not be a recent convert or he may become puffed up and conceited. He's going to be so full of himself because he has put himself above God and above other people that he wants his stuff done his way. So we don't want somebody who's a recent convert. They need to have a good track record. I'm probably going to be more gracious on the side of deacon than on the side of elder because elder is an overseer. He's got a higher position. A deacon, a deacon is a servant. You know, their job is to roll up their sleeves and get to work on specific tasks as asked by the church leadership. So that's an important thing. Uh, moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders so that he may not fall into disgrace into the snare of the devil. The devil too, Satan, was full of himself and wanted his own way. And probably still thinks, even though he's destined for eternal destruction, that his way is the right way. And as men, we need guys who are humble and trust in God. And we're going to have a good reputation inside the church and out. 
Let's, uh, let's flip the script here and go to deacons. So all of these traits, as I said, for elders, those, those are true for all churchgoers, but deacons are the idea of servants. And there are some character traits, without diving into all of them, that are very similar to that that we've already covered here for elders. Because the deacons, the servants of the church, need to carry on some of the same responsibilities. They need to have a good reputation. They need to be the husband of one wife. They, they need to have uh, self-control. They need to be disciplined in their life. That's important. But where does the, the, the elder and the deacon twist come from? Like, are they the same thing? Are they different? This is just a way for me to explain some biblical terms and ways that you'll understand it. And a connection... You, you'll probably hear us refer to these kind of people more as either servants or as ministry team leaders because they're going to have a specific role. Their, their job is to lead a particular area, to serve in a particular way. And that needs to be passed on from the elders to the deacons because if the elders get caught up in the day-to-day -day operations, then they miss the big picture. They miss the ability to pray and to teach and to study like they should be. And so they have people, and this comes from the book of Acts in chapter 6, where there were, were widows coming in, elderly people who needed to be taken care of, and, and the elders said, we need to find some godly men who can take care of these people so that we can continue to study and pray and do what we need to do. And so I would say for us, a good leader, a godly leader knows how to delegate, how to give stuff away. This is a hard thing. Because in my mind, and probably in some of your minds as well, Whatever it is that I want to accomplish, I can probably do that better than anybody else. And if I give it to you, I'm going to have to micromanage you, tell you what to do, answer your silly questions about what you're doing. And for me, that's frustrating. Okay, I'm just laying it on the line. And so the best way that I can think of to help me get over myself is to give it away. Because now I'm putting the trust back where it belongs. I'm putting it in the hands of God. God, you are in control of this and not me. You are, you are managing this church and not me. You are the leader and not me. And, and you, have, you have called all people to serve and not just me. And it doesn't have to be my way. And so I learned to adjust to how people do it. Is it always done the way I want it? No. But my guess is probably you need to learn how to give away stuff too. Whether that's at work or at home. I mean, there are jobs that our kids can do that we simply aren't trusting them to do. And I think they can do it. We have kids here that come in and set up and help tear down. They can work. We just need to oversee them and help them and encourage them. We have ministries that we should be inviting other people to come serve alongside of us so that they can learn how to do it. We can teach them. We can show them. We can tell them. We can unleash them to do that. And maybe, just maybe, we'll work ourselves out of a job and we can find something else to do. So we're not doing it just so that we can back out and run away and go retire from ministry someplace. We're doing it because we want to build up the church. We want to unleash an army. And that's what these leaders were doing. They're saying, hey, we want to progress. We want to do more. So we're going to become more and we're going to do what we need to do. But to do this, we have to give stuff away. So godly leaders are going to delegate and they're going to trust God and they're going to unleash other people. That's an important part. And I'm going to focus in on another thing here that I think is pretty important because it talks about deacons, lists out some uh, instructions. And then in verse 11 it says, Wives likewise should be dignified, not slanderers, but sober-minded, faithful in all things. And then it goes right back to deacons. Why does this happen? And why does it happen here under the category of deacon, but not under elder? Because I would assume with an elder being an overseer that his wife is pretty important too. I think she is. But I don't think this passage is talking specifically about the, the deacon's wives. I think this is talking about female servants. Well, how does that deal with what Paul just said? Like, I don't permit women to teach. Well, I think that, that our context is maybe a little bit different. And I think that maybe what they were dealing with, some of the false teaching, was coming from some of the women who were, were taking on positions that they shouldn't have. And women have always been teaching at home and they've been leading alongside of their husbands. Priscilla and Aquila tag-teamed it, did it together. We can see that, that there are, are several examples of women taking leadership roles. Go back to Romans 16 and you just read through this list of people. And among those are several ladies. And one of those, her name is Phoebe. And she was referred to as a deacon, as a servant. And so I would be willing to say that, that this Scripture is actually saying that we can have both male and females serving in the office of deacon, which is to be a servant. We already have them here. 
believe it or not. We have men and women who roll up their sleeves and get to work and help advance the cause of Connection Christian Church, the cause of God's work here in Columbus. But you know, we do reserve the, the eldership for men because we feel like that's God's design, that's God's role, but the, the men need to be of godly character. Uh, so you can ask me about further questions on that if you want, but, but uh, you know, there's, there's some, definitely some evidence when you go back to the, to the original language to determine what does that word actually mean. Does it mean woman? Does it mean wife? Does it mean servant? And uh, we've got some other examples throughout Scripture to guide that. So I hope that this has been uh, an enlightening time for you. It, it's probably not just like a, oh wow, he really spoke to me today, but maybe it was more like, Okay, this is what we're striving for. Guys, we are a baby church looking to make it to the next step to establish our own leadership, to be able to manage things right here at Connection. And we need to make sure that we don't make boneheaded decisions and put wrong people in the, in the wrong places because that's going to hurt us for a long time. But we need people who are going to step up. But we have, we have workplaces that need godly people that are going to step up. We have homes that need godly people that are going to step up. And maybe these character traits can be something that you can grab a hold of and learn from and pursue on your own. As I said before, if you're a guy and you want to follow through with these and you want to go through them step by step, let me know and we'll try to get you information on that as well. Father, we thank you so much for allowing us to get together here in your house today and to learn from your word as Paul is writing to Timothy. But help us to see how that helps us as a young church to get on the right path. Help us uh, as young Christians, some of us, to get right with you, that we want to pursue self-control, that we want to be disciplined, that we want to have right thoughts, that we want to be more of a, a steady eddy in the way that we approach life, that, that we don't want to be controlled by any outside substance or that, that we're pursuing after uh, any other people other than our husband or our wife. Father, help us to be right with you, to lead faithfully, whether at home, at work, in the church, or just in, at play in the community. Father, may you be glorified in our lives. Give us the power of your spirit in us to live right and faithful lives. And we thank you so much for the grace of Jesus Christ who makes all of this possible. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.